it has been inspiring and uncomfortable to your point about, about discomfort to many to see the level of intensity and passion and care, not just here in the United States, but all around the world to say, you know what, like, fuck this, this has got to stop. Actually, now today, this has got to stop. First, they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I am not Jewish. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. This quote came from a post-war confession made in 1946 by the German Lutheran pastor about the cowardice of German clergy, including by his own admission himself. So, if you are someone who is wondering right now what the death of George Floyd has to do with you, well, there's your answer. And so here we are. The entire country is weeping, not just from his murder, but from centuries of oppression. But how can it be that the year 2020 and this brutality still exists? And so I begin to ask myself the very question I ask myself when I look at achieving anything. What is the no BS answer to change? What would have to actually happen in order for there to be actual change to systemic racism? And I realize that for there to be real change, first, we must change. Now, if there's one thing I've learned from doing this show, it is this. In order to grow, change, and achieve any goal, first, we must be willing to get uncomfortable. And this is no different. In order for us to actually make change, we must be willing to have the hard conversations. Because to do better, we need to know better. And to know better means we must all step outside of our comfort zone. Now, this is not something that can be solved overnight. It can't be solved by one conversation or one Instagram post. You don't just build a house. For the house to remain standing during any storm, it needs a foundation. And every foundation needs a blueprint. So consider today's guest, our architect. A woman who went from working at a coffee beanery designing smiley faces on lattes to working her way up the ladder to become the first ever president of Sean P. Diddy Combs' company, Comb Enterprises. She is a perfect example that your gender and race doesn't define you, and she is hell-bent to spread that word. Actively involved with a network for teaching entrepreneurship, she provides entrepreneurial training to high school students, as well as sits on the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. So guys, please help me welcome the woman who Essence Magazine named a leader of the new school, my homie, Dear Sims. Thank you so much, Lisa. Oh, girl, welcome to the show. Um, me and you have um, definitely developed a close friendship after you were first on the show, um, maybe a year ago now. And when um, George Floyd, when that murder happened, I reached out to you to... Um, try and just hear a perspective of, um, you know, from the black community, some um, a community that I currently do not completely understand. And I saw it as my responsibility, every single person's responsibility to get um, knowledge, to learn on this subject and figure out collectively how we can resolve it. And so the first step is the knowledge part. And so reaching out to you and having your perspective has been so freaking powerful. So I just want to say from a personal level, thank you so much for coming on. Um, and I really do believe that this has to start with being honest about the uncomfortable um, conversations that some people still are not having. So I kind of want to start there. Talk to me about what uncomfortable conversations do you see happening? Um either amongst um, your friends or your co-workers or even on social that you think is going to be super important for me and you to start addressing right now? Yes, please. I can't believe it's only been uh, a year. It feels like much longer. And I feel like we've been able to become such good friends in, in such a short period of time. So thank you. And I think thank you for being the example that neither of us have all the answers. Um, but it, it is incredibly important that we are brutally honest and less and frankly less sensitive as a society so that we can freely be truthful with one another to move to the next level the the depth of what will need to be done to overcome the historical atrocities and i say history i mean as early as today uh, mm -hmm. or this morning right mm -hmm. um will require 
bold and significant change. Um, it is it is more than the horrible atrocity we saw that happened with George Floyd. It is actually much more than what is happening with police brutality. Police brutality, as as horrific as we've seen and as much of a problem as the United States, it represents a fraction of 1% of the totality of what needs to change in the way that Black and brown people are treated globally. Um, it has been inspiring and uncomfortable, to your point about, about discomfort to many, to see the level of intensity and passion and care, not just here in the United States, but all around the world to say, you know what, like, fuck this, this has got to stop. Actually, now today, this has got to stop. And although um, I hope, or I will be, uh, holding hands with people like you and anybody who's willing to move forward with change, we can be more disciplined and pointed about what does change look like. And that as everybody marches around the entire world to make a change, what are we marching towards so that we know uh, a change did in fact come? I think in terms of the uncomfortable conversations, we have to be willing to say on both sides, on both sides for black and brown people and for white people to be very candid about how we each feel and the legitimacy of each person's point of view. I am not a person, I do not believe, I adamantly don't believe in the idea that perception is reality. Um, I think it is a, uh, a thing that has led to the detraction of science and math, and there are things that are real. We are really here, the sun really exists, the brick house really is there. Nonetheless, the way our behaviors are governed by the information that we receive, that is in fact real. And if I am a, a white woman who has very few interaction with black people and everything I've learned about them is from the news, or media, I, I a thousand percent understand what that white woman would say. Seems like there's some problems going on in the black community. Everything I've seen is about um, crime and sadness and despair. It would be like, everybody has a friend that you know that has a lot of drama in their life and you're like, mm, that gotta be something with them. You can't have this many problems. It's hard to contemplate if you're not sitting in the seat. You know, as a, as a black woman, I can see how if you have not experienced this, it actually sounds unrealistic. If justice has always been a beautiful friend to you and someone you can rely on has been consistent, then it sounds actually unrealistic that the police are just going after your community over and over again. You must be doing something wrong. You know, as the daughter of a police officer in New York, I have seen both sides of it and understand very deeply that we will not get through it unless we are willing to get real uncomfortable. That was so amazing. And I really, this is another reason why I so desperately wanted you on this show was because when you are able to not judge people and look and say, I get it. It's not that you're saying I accept it, but you're right. saying I get it. And I think that that becomes step number one. But the things we've been taught over time has then shaped our perspective. So here we are. We have certain people, including myself, where I have a certain frame of reference. And if you're okay telling your story that you were telling me the other day about yeah. when you wear a baseball hat, and it's stories like this that I want to hear more of so that I can right. shape my perspective into being more accurate because I recognize that what I know now is what I know. And so step number one is, see where people are at and now go, how do we change that perspective? So please, please. No, explain. yeah, hundred percent. This is a very, actually it is, a, I think it's a related story. If you don't mind, I'd want to share where Absolutely. Um, I was at, um, I was out in Aspen at Aspen Ideas with a woman, older white woman, brilliant, uh, an advocate for civil rights, um, who is somebody who has supported the black community all of her life. And she said to me, um, she said, I have noticed that black women tend to always be overdressed. She said, I think it's a sign of their insecurity. And I said, well, I think it's actually a sign of, as black people, um, and I learned this from my grandmother and a lot of my friends also did too, we have to be so extra, right? Your fabrics need to be so amazing. You need to be so um, poised and pointed and sharp and phenomenal. Not, not to just be taken seriously, but to kind of like not be abused, right? You know what I mean? So like, if I'm walking into a store, instead of somebody having the initial inclination that I'm there to do harm or that I shouldn't be taken seriously, I can maybe get a little extra point if I'm dressed really, really well. 
And I, we learned that from all of our grandparents, that they had to be dressed to the nines every day to try to hope that they would not be abused or be taken seriously or be treated with respect when they went into the world. And to the story I mentioned to you when we spoke uh, about this, a very simple story, because I am normally, I do normally make sure that I am dressed as pristine as possible to this day as a bit of armor going into the world, but I had to go to my storage unit in Harlem. So I was dressed down and I had a baseball cap um, and I went to the storage unit and I pulled out in my car and um, I'm driving down and a police officer pulls me over. And as he's approaching the car, he has his hand on his, you know, his hand on his hip. He doesn't, doesn't take his gun out, but hand on his hip. And his whole countenance is very like, window down, your hands on the wheel, good. And then I turn towards, the, I turn towards him and look up and I have like, it's clearly a girl, red lips and whatever. So he almost starts laughing. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. Have a great day. I didn't mean to pull you over. But, so there's actually no reason to pull me over, except for the fact that you thought that I was a young black man. And that's a very very small story that happened thousands of times and is nothing compared to the people who are losing their lives. But it's an example of the kind of thing that we live with every day, all day and contemplate before walking out. I think Lisa, you gave back to me a really good example. I think that um, particularly women can resonate with, which was, you know, the checklist of what a woman does when she's going out for the night versus a man. If a man's going out, maybe he sprays on some cologne, gets in his car and walks out. Checklist done, right? Where a woman it could be very conscious about, well, do, you, do I need to put my fire, my iPhone on so my friends know where I am, who am I meeting? I can't park next to vans or cars. I have to make sure I'm parking in a lit spot. Do I have my mace? Do I have my pepper spray? Do I know what car she's? Have I notified where I am? Have I notified when I move to the next place? Because our safety is is so much more vulnerable than that for men. Um, and that's what, you know, black people experience every day of their life from birth. And black women experience both of those things in concert. So it's an amplified experience of fear and an amplified experience of feeling under attack every time you step, not even out of your home, if you look at the recent situation with Brianna. Yeah. Um, God, and that's the thing is that it's, Yes, I mean, there's so much like hearing about the violence and the brutality, but there's something to, like you said, it's such a small thing about wearing a hat and getting pulled over. But it really, there was something super powerful about the hat situation because it feels like the, the brutality, at least for me, is once removed. But the hat thing, I get it because, like you said, when I walk into a boardroom, I'm very aware that I'm female, very aware. So when I walk into that boardroom, I feel like I have to compensate in essence with mm -hmm. authority because I'm just like, oh, God, like if I don't come in like that, all the other <laughs> yes. men, yes. I, I'm not putting down men at all, but all the other men will perceive me in a certain way. And it's freaking exhausting, but I have to do it. So able to hear your side of it in that sense allows me to reflect how, I am um, dealing with some, God, not even in the closest remote sense, but I think this, the moment we can start to put ourselves in other people's shoes yes. is the yes. moment that we can start to feel. The moment we start to feel, we can start to act. And I think that that's why this revolution has really, really kicked off worldwide, like you said, because people are feeling. It wasn't a story that was told. People saw the video of George on the floor and felt it. And I think that yes. it's the feeling it that is now causing people to take action and to change. But in in everything that has happened, there have been things that have come up that I, I'm just going to throw my hands up because I always want to improve, as you know, and grow and learn. So I'm going to throw in my hands up and just say, I've been naive to, re to not realize that certain things were happening. So let's even take systemic racism. I didn't even really know what that meant. I had to look it up. I watched a video about it because, again, I think that I need to educate myself in order to be a part of this conversation. So right. I, I, but I didn't even think through systemic racism. Um, can you give us a little breakdown on systemic racism and then uh, we can kind of dive into that? Yeah, so I think, uh, and I can speak to, you know, this is a U.S. experience, right? Yeah. But... Um, you think about the way wealth is typically generated through ownership of the land or ownership of a home, um, you know, assets or through capital markets, right? Which blacks have not had access to. As, a, as, an, as an example, uh, if you look at the woman, the, the girl who was the first black child to go into an integrated school uh, after civil rights, she just turned 65, like this year. 
Right? So it's not some it's not something from Mesopotamia, right? It was yesterday that <laughs> this happened. And, and actually, I think an, an interesting example is because sometimes <clears throat> when you look at black people who are successful and you feel like, oh, well, this is great. I, I, I think interesting examples, when I was working with, with Puff um, and we wanted to, we looked into buying an NFL team and it became a popular thing because what was happening with the NFL, we felt like the NFL was not treating their players and black people at large uh, appropriately with the level of respect that was needed. So it would be great to have black ownership. But when we really dug all the way into it, you realize that honestly no different than like the Voting Rights Act where if your grandfather hadn't voted, you couldn't vote, which made no sense because your grandfather was a slave. In trying to buy an NFL team, the amount of liquidity that you would have to part with a black person who's worth a billion dollars today, which is less than, you know, which is less than 10 in the United States, they are making their money right now. They can't just part with like, oh, yeah, sure, I can part with $800 million and just put it aside. They absolutely can't. So even for the people who have made it, things like getting an NFL team are almost impossible to them because they can't go into the historical family wealth or they can't sell the land that they the, the hundred acres that they inherited or the one acre or the half acre. And it's quite deeply rooted in banking, including mortgages, in schools, in terms of history, um, in terms of community policing, in terms of jobs. I'll give you another quick example. Studies show that if you have an ethnic sounding name on your resume, you are 50% less likely to get called for a job. It's not a coincidence that the black unemployment rate is almost always twice as high <laughs> as the general market. That's literally just the freakiest correlation of math I've ever seen, or it's an obvious cause and effect. Um, when you look at redlining as another example, where when communities were uh, in, the, in, the, in the 19, I guess, I don't know, maybe like 70, 80 years ago, when um, bankers sit down and draw lines around, well, this community is all black. So we put a red line around. It could have been a middle-class, thriving, amazing community. If it was all black or all minority at that time, all Jewish, um, it received a red line. And that red line still impacts. If you do, if you lay over maps from that time to now, you will see how those same communities who were ineligible for loans or had to pay for at exorbitant criminal rates, if they were able to even get a loan, were disenfranchised as a result of that because you can't build wealth if you only rent. You can't build wealth if you don't have a uh, a loan to be able to get land, to build your own farm, to be able to have something to own to pass down. So if you are always sh sharecropping and renting, you do not build anything for the next generation, which is where we stand today. Things like lexicon are incredibly important. As a person who builds brands, we spend a lot of time thinking through exactly what color are you going to use for your package? What words are you going to use? How does something become sticky or viral on social? Um, if black people were a brand, we have had terrible branding, right? I mean, in terms of the history of this country, right? So if you go in the dictionary, everything bad is associated with the word black. That wears on somebody by the time they're three or four years old at the most. Um, we talked, Lisa, about the, the brown-eyed, blue-eyed study, which I feel needs to be mandatory content. By the time you're seven years old, you need to see that. And if you're not familiar with this, A, please Google it and watch it. But um, it shows how this teacher deals with the classroom, all white, in a town that was all white, all Christian at the time, um, in the middle of the last civil rights era in the 60s. And she conducted an experiment over, I think, two or three days, very short, uh, maybe just two days, uh, with her brown-eyed students and her blue-eyed students. And essentially, as an example, she went to all the blue-eyed students and said that brown-eyed are superior. You blue-eyes are lazy. It's nothing you can do to stop it. It's genetic. Um, and she gave them less time on the playground and she reinforced things and said, oh, you don't have your glasses today. Well, wouldn't expect much from a blue eye and those types of things over one day. Within just two days, these kids, kids who were previously doing well on tests started doing poorly. These kids started getting into a fight and what was before just a description, like I'm blue eyed, all of a sudden became like a, a curse word. In fact, one of the kids compared it to being called a nigger in two days. If you can imagine that level of systemic uh, abuse, of lexicon manipulation, of media mismanagement and misinformation over and over and over again for centuries at every turn, you start to see how, A, you're doing a disservice to both sides because A, you have, you have a white person who actually starts to really believe, well, I am actually superior. On this experiment, one of the kids said, I loved being superior. He said, I felt like a king. 
he seems like six years old, right? That's how, and you can also understand how if you feel like a king and somebody comes to you and says, well, we should be treated equally. It doesn't feel, it feels almost as if you're being attacked, like your kingdom is under attack, which is a way when I think about if I am, again, if I'm a white person who's never been exposed and all of a sudden you're asked for equal rights, it does not feel like equal rights. It feels like you were trying to strip me of my superiority. You're trying to strip me of my natural goodness. And I'm just naturally better than you, which is just not true. Um, and everybody has to deal, I think, head on face in the mirror of understanding each of our roles and saying like, well, God, A, as black people who have been hearing this over and over again, have, has anybody started to believe it? Had, uh, is, is there a matter of insecurity as a black community of saying, well, like, damn, I mean, we are, why is every word terrible? Why are we being over policed? Instead of looking at the systems that have been in place, to, which really just comes down to the economics, to manage the economics rather, to continue a system where you have a very small group of wealthy people at the top and you give poor people, poor white people, a false target of saying, oh, this is these minorities. There is a running joke in the black community, and I don't, maybe it's not just the black community, but I've always known. They said that, the, that a poor, the, the, the thing a poor white man can always hold on to is that he is better than a black person. He may not be rich, but he's better than a black man. So you said so many powerful things and there's one thing that really freaking sticks out that if you're a kid, like to kind of go down it a bit more. So you were saying yeah. about how, um, you know, just in two days, these kids are basically taught and um, can either feel inferior or feel superior depending on what they are told. And the reason why I think that's so powerful comes to remind me of the study that they did with those these little young Asian girls where they took a bunch of young Asian women and they basically put them uh, to have a test, uh, you know, a, a maths test. And before they went in to do the test, they told these young girls, they reminded them, hey, remember, you're a woman. So they go in, they take the test. Then they get in a different group of Asian girls. Before they go in to take the test, they would lean, let in and said, remember, you're Asian. And mm. the, the results, the data was so freaking like astonishing that the group that were told they were Asian um, scored so much higher than the group that were told they were women. Now, exactly. They, they, they were the same class, their, um, their intelligence was all roughly the same. So just in what you are told and the belief you have about yourself has a consequence and a result. Going back to what you're saying, if depending on where you're born, what your skin color is, what you've been taught, will then in effect have an effect on the results of your life. So I think education is such a powerful tool. And again, I'm just grasping the straws here. Like I don't actually know the answer, but it seems based on our discussion and based on these studies that if we're able to educate the younger generation, the kids um, into understanding and not having this, um, this racial divide, the hope is that makes a dent somewhat. Well, here's a, this is a major portion of it for sure, is that we are not, the history books and what you are taught in schools, in American schools, it, there's, it, it's frankly close to just pure propaganda to a certain degree. There's a, any success of black and brown people are largely eliminated. Um, I, I just found out that the richest man in the history of the world, Mansa Musa, was a black man last year. I'm 44. Right. So there are certain things that we just don't you don't learn. You don't learn. There are different periods in history and different conquerors. You don't learn about the uh, b black generals, the black leaders. You don't learn anything about the continent of Africa. You don't learn about the slave revolutions and what they were done. You also don't learn about the depth of um, the, the depth and the strategy of slavery. And what does it do when somebody can be burned and killed for learning how to read two sentences and how families are ripped apart and how uh, one of the best jobs you could get was to be studded out because at least you didn't have to be getting beat on the field, right? And in terms of like seeing mothers, mothers, yes, of course they would like to leave, but you've taken their kids away from them and um, how food was manipulated, et cetera. And just the mental abuse and anguish and the intensity, the level of really just evil doing, the strategy, the consistency, just how horrific, how truly horrific slavery was and what it did to the black community is very much glossed over um, and not properly taught. And conversely, I think the greatness, uh, the intelligence, the innovation, the brilliance, the fighting back, the inventions, 
um, things that came out of the Black American community and it has never been told. What has been um, also eliminated is the history of the of the great things that happened in the continent of Africa. That just isn't taught at all um, <laughs> in, in U.S. history. And that's a bigger issue in general because the United States, I think, does a terrible job about teaching uh, from a global point of view, right? You have you have maybe a semester of global history, whereas other countries actually deeply teach where we stand in the world, what other languages are like. We're now we're at a point now, unfortunately, in the last it's gotten worse in the last twenty years, where people are literally actively attacking people who speak other languages as if that's something to be embarrassed about. Yeah, hearing what you're saying about um, all these incredible black people that have um, are not taught in schools, it immediately reminded me of um, the guy that ran the four minute mile, right? Where it's like people kept saying it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done. So people weren't trying because they didn't believe it was possible. The second right. the guy was ended up running the mile in four minutes, I think yes. since since then that record has been broken thirteen hundred times. Why? Yeah. Because the second people saw it was possible, gave them the belief. Once they believed it was possible, they would act in accordance. And so, as yes. you were talking about the educational part of it, it yes. made me think about okay, I understand why actually that is extremely important. Because, like you were saying, right, you're forty four and you just found out that one of the wealthiest people of all time was black. It's like if if we if we're not told that as children, all races, then it doesn't allow us to think of um, black people as being able to achieve that, which then instills a certain mindset. But I think in emphasizing that, in teaching that, it allows, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, the black community to feel like anything is possible and teaching that to the children so that they can then act in accordance to um, strive for greatness. Yeah, I mean, we often say like you can't be what you don't see, and you have two things here happening, right? One is there are there are no examples being taught in mainstream institutions or school and or on the media about um, the success of Black and Brown people. So that's a detriment to everybody. That's a detriment to white people not knowing what's possible. That's a detriment to Black people not knowing what's possible. Then on, then on top of that, um, for those who are taught at home or taught in their community or taught in their churches and saying, well, no, I don't believe that. I don't. I know that I could do this. The level to get ahead, the race is so scattered with, you know, with nails and thorns and difficulty and ropes in your way and oil slicks. But what it takes to be a successful, alive black bus driver, as an example, that man could easily probably be the governor of his state, right? Like for us to be able to get to make one single million dollars, which is not a lot of money, it's a lot of work and convincing and and still fighting and explaining why you're there and justifying yourself over and over and over again with a lack of information and a dearth of support. Um, I think that's the part that, again, is hard to contemplate if you're not living it. And I think Black people have uh, been penalized in the past for raising it. So we suffer in community silence and try to chip things away you know, a centimeter at a time. And it's just, it's not working for anybody involved. And it's to the economic detriment of this country to not capitalize on the genius that exists within black and brown communities. There is no zip code that has a lock on genius, but to unlock it, right, you have to put the proper tools in place, the proper resources and the level of education that we just discussed. And then they have to be able to get alone with that information and have the appropriate amount of support and get an interview, right? And actually be brought in the conversation at the table. Even those who have the best of intentions, if you are trying to solve problems for the people who have the problems and the problem holders are not invited to the solution party, then we are going in a, um, you know, a, a circle that is ineffective and will not produce the results that anybody's seeking, even if there's a, a, a confluence of good intentions. I'm glad that you really said that because that really brings to this episode, this discussion in that like, I really don't know how to handle it. This is all very new to me and I'm very open and willing to be coached, you know, to be taught, to learn. Um, But it's super freaking uncomfortable, right? Because it's like at the end of the day, it is... um, It is not an experience I have personally had. And so I'm, I am... Um, trying to be open and um, understand and hear and then say it like you said this isn't just a black person's problem we need to talk about the realities I need to be 
um, like I said, educated on it, of the realities, because it's not a life that I have necessarily lived. So I don't expect this conversation to then be like, okay, it's all great. And now we're good to go, right? <laughs> um, I, you know, education is just a, a, a small fraction of then yeah. seeing it all the way through to taking the action and seeing the results. And even something that I'd said earlier, I want to bring up. So I'd given the reference to the, the, um, the test with the Asian girls. Yeah. And so even that comes back down to um, implicit biasness, right? Is, is because, you know, but, um, implicit bias is, well, Asians are smart. Women right. are less smart, right? Sometimes that bias can really serve you, right? So it's like if, if you're Asian and the bias is that Asians are smart at maths and then they're reminded of that, it can seriously serve them in incredible ways. But of course, as we've seen, it can also be a massive detriment. So yes. talking about kind of like the education part of it and the biasness and then seeing how we can somehow turn it around. And so I just, I see this as such a long-term play and a long-term issue that we're having to deal with um what do you think are certain steps that we can do apart from education apart from these conversations um that we can maybe start taking action whether it's from an individual level or a governmental level we're out of time right so i think unfortunately you know, the, re the reality is, and I see your point, and you and I have talked about this before, right? You, you we've, I've read it, and I'm sure you've read it, that it takes literally 100,000 years to make a significant change to your brain's kind of neural pathways in terms of evolution. So it's not easy to completely change your habits, but it is a thousand percent possible. And you can see we are not there yet, as an example, with what has gone on in women's rights in the last five years. But I think what has happened in the last five years is more than has happened in the last 20 years. So I think when we think about what will happen for Black uh, Americans, we just cannot wait and we cannot accept it. So that will require, I think, dramatic responses in order to get dramatic action. Um, and, and, it, and it will also require an audacity of thought and approach. And the severity of what has occurred has to be uh, commensurate with the response. Is it similar to what the GI Bill did for veterans and is still doing in the, you know, in the last 10 years, where it is a significant and wide sweeping legislation to address the gap. Is it things like, well, actually there are cities where you have black people essentially through taxes paying for their persecution. On the flip side of that, if a police officer is actually given a civil award, taxpayers are paying for that. So if you're a black taxpayer, you're paying for your persecution and you pay for the penalty. That makes no sense at all. You may have to go to cities and say, hey, city, you owe Black Americans back taxes for the last 50 years, this percentage allocation. Like, we will need some dramatic responses, I think, in order to have real change. And as you know, and I think I heard you speak about this eloquently, is sometimes your the practice of your behaviors have to speed ahead of your mind, and you have to do it in reverse. Um, and then you, we've talked about kind of like the power of posing and forget the wonderful woman's name, I think Amy McCuddy, Amy McCuddy, whatever, has done a lot of work on this where you can trick your body by doing certain things. Um, and if you pretend to be asleep, sometimes your body will fall asleep. Or if you pose in a confident way, sometimes your mind will follow. We will have to behave in the way that we expect and our mind may not catch up for a century, but I think the behaviors cannot be tolerated anymore. We are plumb out of time. Yeah, that's so true. And I, I really do hope that you're right, that it doesn't take as long to, um, to unwind. And I think it really does not even unwind. That's actually the wrong word. I need to catch myself for doing that. It's actually not unwind. It's getting to a place that we've never been that we should be before. At. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. you know, like I, I go back to the Einstein quote, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So if we actually right. want to expect a different result, then we have to change our behavior. And so to change our behavior means I think that we have to come together. So do you have any thoughts on how we do that? Yeah, I'm on the, um, I work with an organization called Thread in Baltimore and is run by a brilliant woman who's a neuroscientist. And um and it is really quite literally about how the threads of society are inextricable. And you can't, if you think like, well, I'm going to sit in this neighborhood and what happens over there doesn't happen to me. It is a ludicrous proposition and it's not something that's sustainable. We are all inextricably connected, as we can see with what's happening with climate change and the racial divide. And we can go on and on. Right. Um, it will eventually end up on your doorstep. So how can we be pro proactive? Uh, 
about moving ahead. So my dad uh, said to me that once garages became mainstream in America, it was one of the things that contributed to a lack of community and a lack of conversation because you were not forced to speak to your neighbors on the block kind of when you went out. You could just go straight into your home without ever having to speak to anyone. Um, and that is something that thread kind of represents, and I'm forgive my long winded way into that to the answer. That the, the 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 organization focuses on kids that um, have literally like 0. .025 GPAs, and we surround them with a family of volunteers, to like about five to ten people, who stick with that kid for ten years. We actually modeled it like on gangs, yeah. um, and essentially we do absolutely whatever it takes: help them with their homework, pick them, take them to school. If God forbid they get arrested, you know help them navigate the criminal justice system, help them get an employment. And these kids go from um, less, the likelihood of graduating being less than 5% to over 90% grad high school graduation rates. And high school graduation is one of the biggest indicators of like later success, more money in life, right? The way that it works and our real goal is to desegregate Baltimore. Because if you get to seven to 9% of the population of Baltimore, you start to get to a point and you can actually have a tipping point where everyone knows each other. Baltimore is a great city as an example because the segregation there is pre-civil rights levels in terms of where people live. Um, and there are people in East Baltimore who will live their whole lives and never go to West Baltimore and the converse is true. Um, and I started to say, I think that is symbolic of what's happening across the country in that we have become so singular and so insular um, that at a time when information is at its greatest, connection is at its lowest. And there are, how can you have empathy for somebody you don't know? Um, if you have never been to a black person's house, if you've never been to a white person's house, you, there is, I, I don't, to me, I don't see how you start to have any level of, of love or empathy or sympathy for how we're jointly connected when you don't have to do anything but look at a screen. Um, so I do think it is incredibly important that you figure out how to have better, true community. And again, sometimes I'm, I'm not opposed to sometimes forcing the behaviors to lead the activity. Like, how do you ensure that there's real interaction? One of the things with police specifically is there's a school of thought about why community policing works so well is when the police live in the community and they know, oh, little Johnny has ADHD, so we're gonna treat him a little bit differently, or I know his mother, so instead of me you know, handling this this way, I'm gonna call his mom, or I'm not gonna be beating people that I'm gonna see at the supermarket or when we all go to Johnny's for dinner. I can't, I can't do it, I live here. I actually know these people. And I think the fact that we no longer have a connection where you know your fireman, where your grandmother lives five blocks has actually been to our detriment, and I love traveling as much as the next person. I love the fact that we can be a mobile society to learn as much as we can for each other. But the disconnect of community, I think, is crippling us in the way we interact, in the lack of civility, and the, even the way people communicate with you. No, no, the way people communicate on social media would never have occurred to this degree of this intensity in the town square, right? But people feel so free uh, when they have the, uh, when they can be anonymous behind a screen. So I think that's incredibly important. That said, you know, extreme times do call for extreme measures. And when when communities are disenfranchised and abused over and over again, they are not going to continue to take it. Um, and I'm not desirous to see deep levels of violence on either side, but it's a situation where I feel this community is responding in self-defense. Um, I feel that the response is not even requited to what has happened. And, and I hope and God forbid that we ever get to a point that it is in fact commensurate, which I think everybody is trying to avoid. Yeah, I, um, it's that uh, Martin Luther King quote, um, or is it rioting is the voice of the unheard or the language of the unheard, I think? Language of the unheard, um, yes. Yeah, it's like a, a, God, I hate to say it, but like a, a boiling pot, right? Where it's like, it's been simmering and it's like the lid has now finally come off and it's like it's boiling over so for me and the reason why i use that analogy for me um i just i try to absolutely instead of um, judging anyone try and like we were saying earlier putting our, our ourselves in those shoes and so understanding what is happening now why people are reacting the way they do is also something that allows me to help understand the the extent of the situation and the extent of hurt and pain that has been going on for so long um so it really has allowed me to kind of get an insight and let me be honest right i've known of course racism exists 
But it has taken this for me absolutely to have this conversation with you, right? right. And we've right. never spoken about race in, our, in, right. the, in the time that we've known each other. So it's almost like it's been this underlying issue that no one's, not even no one, that me and you definitely haven't even spoken. So it, it does take sometimes things like this to have to occur absolutely. in order for people to actually then start having these conversations. We're all in a relationship with one another, but we've not had this conversation where black people are having it with black people all the time and some white people are having it with other white people all the time. Um, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that as a society and as individuals with me and you, that we're having this conversation. It is crazy in retrospect to think that how many times have we spoken or had fun or had great times and this, we wouldn't, and we never would have, no. to be honest. We probably never would have unless a particular incident drove it. And, and I want to make, I think, a mo more important point because... I think most importantly was because you reached out to have this conversation and I am, and my white friends who reached out this week to say, I don't even know what I don't know, you know, and I, but I don't want to be an asshole. So like, what should I be doing? I'm here to listen. That is so incredibly important and it is meaningful because um, I do think it is important that it is, it is, it is the white people taking the time to read and learn. It meant a great deal to me that when I mentioned black and brown, I said to you that you went and said, I went and watched it on your own. And I'm really, you know, it's interesting to me and sent me back more information about that. I didn't even know. Um, it's not going to work any other way. It's like, if you're in a marriage with somebody and you just literally, you just never argue. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's probably, you're probably not being honest. It's probably a lack, a significant lack of honesty there. There's probably something shaking your foundation. It doesn't have to be combative argument, but it is important that you have the freedom to have a clear and honest discussion with each other and, and be free to disagree and be free to share the things that were uncomfortable to share just last week. Yeah, that's so I love that you actually equated it to relationships because I think that a lot of people can relate to that, right? It's like, look, you take two people in a relationship. If you're not talking about the, the, the hard things, if you're not addressing the real fundamental root issues, you're not, and I am totally with you. Other people may be different, but there's no way I could have a deep, meaningful relationship with my husband if we didn't argue, if we didn't discuss our differences because everyone has differences. But if we yeah. weren't open about it, if we weren't, um, if we we didn't have that then we wouldn't be able to get deep and so saying that and um, saying that we have to go deep on this we have to address things we have to discuss them even if they're difficult it's going to be yes. a continuous discussion there are going to be times yes. where we don't agree there are going to be times where we see different you know opposition and that's okay as long as we're always articulating and having the same goal like, I yes. always freaking come back to that with my relationship, with anything. It's like, this is a tough time. We're having the tough discussions. I'm just saying as a re reflection of my relationship. But yes. our goal is to have a happy marriage. So if we can agree on this goal, no matter yes. what happens on the journey, we're both going to stay strong and communicate because we have this same goal. And that's almost exactly how I see this, right? Is we have the same goal. We have to get through the freaking weeds. We have to get through the uncomfortable things. We have to get through talking about things and being okay with disagreeing about something. Yes. If we have this same goal in mind, because that's how we're going to get there. Is that no? Exactly. Exactly. Well, girl, man, I could keep talking to you for so long. I really do admire, respect, and just am so. Um, very much honored to have this conversation with you because like I said, it isn't an easy discussion. Me and you have never spoken about this before and in the time that we've known each other. And I just want to also just ask you one last question. Is there anything yes. that you feel like that you haven't said here that is important for you to get across to people listening and watching right now? I think it's incredibly important for us as a group to stay focused. I am... Um, there are a lot, lot of distractions and there are a myriad of issues um, that we all could be attacking. Um, but to be effective, I think no different than you would in your own personal life or at work, we really have to be, be ruthlessly focused on overcoming this large and gaping issue in front of us. Um, so I already see on social media a lot of fracturing and subsections and um, and I think we, we can be all susceptible to like to magpie syndrome of moving to the next shiny object, but this is not a social media trend, right? This is not a, the newest challenge. 
These are people's real lives. This is our real um, history and our collective history hanging in the balance. So I just think it's incredibly important to your uh, to your point about the longevity of our dedication to living in a society that respects one another. I actually think the how dramatic the shift has been in my lifetime as a person who's 44 is significant. And it gives me hope that 44 years from now, we can see very dramatic change. Just 20 years ago, the things I had to put up with or just say, well, I'm a woman, so I have to just work harder. I just have to, somebody's going to hit on me and I just have to you know, figure out a way to say, no, thank you, and keep on walking, keep working, that has changed a lot, right? There's no reason. Women now say, absolutely not, I'm not standing for it. You don't want the abuse. You've seen what happens to other people's careers. You don't want that to happen to you. In the last month, seeing officers, um, like just in Atlanta, within, within 24 hours being arrested. So I, I say that to say that we can make significant action quickly. We can make changes quickly. We can show up on day one and make an impact and actually, actually for real change the world. And I think don't um, let none of us be complacent in what each of our individual contributions can be. It does not need to take another 500 years to get things right. We can change things this hour. I'm so glad that you said that because I definitely did worry. I mean, I said it earlier, right, that it's, it may take as long to, un, you know, to kind of get to where we want to go as it's been created. So I... I, it's interesting. I love being called on my own mindset. So thank you for just breaking me of my own mindset. That's super powerful. But it's important, right? It's important to, to not think like that and to be focused on how do we, right? Going back to like, what's the it? no BIS answer? How do we do this? In yeah. a year, in five years, like what you even said about the women, again, going back to using the language that really I get and I understand when you're saying about how women um, have in, I'm 40 as well, right? So over the last 40 years, I've absolutely seen that massive change. Huge change. So I am. Uh, and from my mother's time, my mother's eight on me a lot from my mother's time now to our grandma's time, like within people's lifetimes who are alive right now, there has been dramatic advancements and shifts. We have room to grow. But it is a, absolutely possible with the, I mean, between the two of us, we can't change the world. So I just want to make sure that we, we go with that spirit and know that it's entirely possible and you can do it now. Boom. Thank you for changing my mindset just right there, girl. That was super powerful. I love it when things happen in real time like that. Um, so thank you so much. And um, where can people follow you? And um, just to let anyone else know who's watching or listening, we're going to be posting a bunch of in the show notes below as well. We're going to have links okay. to some certain websites um, and to certain articles that I found. Yeah. So guys, look below. Um, just ones that I found super useful and super helpful. Um, That's good. But um, is there anywhere where can people follow you and then where do you is where have you been getting a lot of your information yeah so you can follow me at at dia sims which is just my name d-i-a-s-i-m-m-s -M -M at dia sims on all social for ig twitter and facebook and um in terms of where i go i think mark boyle the national urban league is doing a great job i'm excited to see andreessen horowitz has just come out with a new fund um something worth checking out um, and then I think most importantly, uh, and obviously I'm a little bit biased because I was uh, behind getting this off the ground, is Revolt TV does a great job of real time, uh, I think, youth focused news and information. So definitely follow at Revolt um, because we are we are in the midst of a revolution and it doesn't have to be that can be a very good thing. And that's how all great changes have come. I'll make one last point. Uh, which a friend of mine um, made he's, um, uh, from Jamaica. And he said, America is a very young country. You have only really had one revolution. Mm -hmm. So if you look at other countries who have had four and five revolutions, you are overdue. Um, so I think this is the course of evolution in any great country. And instead of our empire falling, we have the opportunity to actually reform through revolution. Wow, I love that. We're going to be putting those links, everything that you just said, we'll put them in the show notes Thank below you. as well. Absolutely. Guys, guys, this woman is so freaking amazing. If you're not following her, you should definitely should be following her um her words of wisdom she's so freaking like the way she speaks is so articulate like gets to me that i understand and it uses the language that allows me to shift my own mindset so i really hope you guys were just as impacted as i was in real time um please 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 do go support 
um, check out the links below. And guys, if you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billiou. But if this episode has brought you value, guys, please do share it. We are desperate, desperately trying to keep this conversation going, open up to as many people as possible. It hasn't been easy for us to sit here and talk very candidly, but I think more and more of this needs to be done. So please do share, get your friends, all sit together, start talking about it, and let's start making a change. Until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. What up guys, Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.